Mom, I've told you once, I've told you a million times, I do not want sugar on my frosties, okay? Oh, there you are. Um, my name is Professor Fowes. I am a historical professor at the library of my bedroom, um, as you can see behind me. And this is one in an occasional series of workshops debating some of the most pressing questions in history. Yes, indeed. This week's pressing question is the peculiar circumstances and results of the death of King Edward the Confessor on the 4th of January 1066. Now, you may recognise the date 1066, and it's not when England won the World Cup, <laughs> because that would be silly, and that wouldn't be long enough ago. And anyway, I'm getting sidetracked. Moving on. So in 1066, Edward the Confessor, King of all of England, died. Normally, this would not create a problem. However, in this case, it does. And it does simply because Edward the Confessor died without having any children. There was nobody left to take over the crown of England, a newly formed country, which is not a good thing. Trust me, trust me on this. So, the Witan convenes. What is the Witan? The Witan was an Anglo-Saxon council of eldermen and lords who would be tasked with choosing the new king of England. Normally, this would not be such a problem. However, in this case it was, mostly because there were not one or two, but four possible claimants to the English throne. So, who were these claimants and what were their claims? First was a young chap called Edgar the Etling. Now, he was 10 years old, but he was a direct descendant of the very great Alfred the Great of England. Although, having said that, he was born in Hungary and did I mention that he was 10 years old? So, a bit young, not ideal, and the Witan were worried that by choosing a 10 year old boy to become the new king, they would leave themselves open to attacks from the Vikings and the Normans. The second claimant to the English throne at this time was a Viking, a Norse Danish king called Harald Hardrada. Now, in 1042, King Edward the Confessor, about whom we have already spoken, was deposed by such king. So Edward the Confessor became King of England in 1042 and stole the crown from, I have it on my notes here, bear with me, bear with me, bear with me. Ah yes, King Hardicanute. Now allegedly, King Hardicanute had promised the throne of England to Harald Hardrada's father, King Magnus of Norway, before he was deposed. Why they don't wipe this stuff down, I don't know. It may be because they cannot read or wipe, but that is hardly there or there, I think. Surely there should be someone around. It must be an iPhone or an iPad or something to record it on. Anyway, moving swiftly on, he is the second claimant. The third person who would claim to be King of England was the most powerful Lord, the Lord of Wessex, Howard Godwinson. Now, Howard Godwinson's claim was very strong indeed. His claim was based on the fact that he was the most powerful noble in all of England and Edward the Confessor was in fact married to Harold's sister, Edith. Simples, as a mere cat might have once said. However, there is some conjecture here because Harold himself claims that on his deathbed, King Edward the Confessor whispered into his ear I command my wife and all my kingdom to your care. Conveniently, nobody else heard Edward the Confessor say such a thing. So there's a, there's a conundrum for us to solve. <laughs> what do we do with this one? Anyway, he had very, very strong support in the Witan. An Anglo-Saxon noble, the richest man in England, easily, and a strong supporter of Edward. He had been inside he had been by his side in many, many battles. Now, 
to throw some more trouble into the pot. There was a fourth claimant. Now, his name was William, Duke of Normandy. Now, William was a strong descendant of the Normans. The Normans got their name from Norsemen, so they were descended from Vikings and were incredibly powerful and strong and, dare I say, brutal, very brutal. So, in 1051, Edward had allegedly said to William that he should succeed him. William, not Edward, because Edward couldn't succeed him if he had died himself, because that just, it's not going to work. Seriously, this isn't. Anyway, ha, moving swiftly on with William's story. So, in 1051, Edward the Confessor allegedly promises the throne of England to William, Duke of Normandy. William, Duke of Normandy, the Normans had come to the rescue of Wessex Britain, England, should I say, many, many times, and were good friends. In fact, it is suggested that Edward was William, Duke of Normandy's cousin. In the past, as well, the mentioned, the aforementioned Howard Godwinson had been shipwrecked off the coast of Normandy and was held hostage. However, William, Duke of Normandy, rescued Howard and took him into his household where they became, I understand, good friends. They went hunting, they fought many battles together, and Howard Godwinson himself promised that he would support William's claim to the throne of England to the extent that he swore an oath to support William on ancient Christian relics. Go figure. So, at this point, the Witan has a choice. Does it choose Edgar the Etheling? Does it choose Harold Hardrada? Does it choose Harold Godwinson? Or does it choose William, Duke of Normandy? What I would say is that William made an oath and he said to his men, that what we are not given, we will take. So, children, it is up to you. You need to decide who you think is best qualified to become the King of England. And I would like you to make a poster, a vote for poster, if you like telling us why we should choose your particular candidate and what qualities they bring to the throne of England. You may do your own research. You may add your own pictures. You may make them as colorful and beautiful as they like. However, in next episode of Professor Farris's historical workshops, we will find out who, in fact, was chosen as King of England in 1066 and why. This had such a ginormous impact on the history of Britain and our language and our food. And it will also explain why some English words are ridiculously difficult to spell. Anyway, I hope you have enjoyed my short lecture and I wish you well in these troubled times. Anyway, I must leave you now as I have to take my daily exercise, which today shall involve walking very, very slowly eating an ice cream. Anyway, take care, stay safe.